So we have now the full panel. Um, my name is Gulami Saksai. I am the UN resident coordinator, and I will be uh, chairing or moderating this uh, uh, panel on uh, which is the second uh, high-level uh, panel of international heads of international organizations. But we're pleased to have also um, a member of the government of Azerbaijan with us. So we have um, a, a very distinguished uh, panelist that uh, represent different organizations and different parts of the UN system, as well as the government of Azerbaijan. Now, after the very fantastic start this morning with uh, his Excellency the President's speech, and also we had other uh, speeches, uh, including a very uh, nice uh, reminder through the video uh, of uh, how history has come along to, uh, to deal with uh, multiculturalism and, and dialogue. Uh, today we're going to, in this panel, uh, deal with, um, uh, with Partnership for Sustainable Development Goal. As most of you know, um, in 2015, uh, world leaders in a historic summit uh, gathered in New York to adopt uh, the Sustainable Development Goals or Agenda 2030. Um, now, I don't want to go into uh, all the different goals, but there are two very uh, specific elements of the goals that uh, the panel will be focusing on. One is Goal 17, which calls for global partnership, and that global partnership uh, expands beyond the United Nations, international organization, and governments alone. Uh, it calls on uh, multiplicity of actors. It calls on private sector, civil society, religious leaders, think tank, media, and so forth, to leverage partnership uh, for financing, to leverage partnership for intercultural dialogue, to leverage partnership for uh, cooperation uh, to achieve these goals. Uh, and these goals, as we know it, are universal. They apply both to both poor countries as well as rich countries. So the universality of these goals uh, makes it a very important uh, initiative that we, we will have to look at. Now, one of the important parts of this partnership is to leverage financing for development and how to find ways to, to redirect wasteful spending and to more development-related uh, uh, initiatives such as spending on health, education, water and sanitation, and what are the priorities of the poor. And I cannot ignore, but one recent fact that I came across was that how much the world spent on military spending 1.8 trillion dollars in 2018 was the global military budget. And now compare that with the meager 153 billion dollar that was provided as official development assistance. And not only that, we've also witnessed that the military expenditure has gone up by several fold in the last three decades, whereas the development and humanitarian expenditure have gone down. So surely there is a need for us to rebalance that, uh, that, that spending in favor of development, equality, and removing poverty. The second very important premise of the Sustainable Development Goal are uh, leaving no one behind. And what it means is that all those people who are now considered poor are basically left behind. They're left behind because they don't have the, the same equal opportunity. They're left behind because they're discriminated and oppressed relative to other members of the society. And today, this population is half the world population. Their number is roughly 3 billion people who are living under $2.5 a day. And if we go down in terms of extreme poverty, that number is 1.3 billion. That's a large number, and we really have an obligation and commitment to address that. Therefore, we believe the social dimension of the Sustainable Development Goal on social inclusion and promoting inclusive societies 
are very relevant to the theme of this uh, forum, but specifically uh, this uh, panel on intercultural dialogue. We believe that intercultural dialogue is an essential ingredient for social transformation and to promote peaceful societies. So without further ado, I would like to turn to our panelists uh, who are going to give us some examples and also focus on the very specific role of the different actors in furthering this partnership for dialogue and to ensuring social inclusion. Um, our first panelist um, is Nada al Nashif, uh, Assistant Director General for Social uh, and Human Sciences for UNESCO. Uh, Nada is not new to Azerbaijan, uh, she's a very good, good friend of Azerbaijan, and also uh, she's been very active in, uh, in the Baku process uh, and uh, have been participating in these events. Uh, on behalf of UNESCO, she's the Assistant Director General for UNESCO. And Nada has a distinguished career uh, in the UN that uh, actually dates back to 1993 or 1992 uh, with UNDP and her last uh, post uh, before the current one was Assistant Director General for ILO. And she's dealing with, in her current job with youth uh, uh, issues and policymakers, communities and cities to combat exclusion, discrimination, and intolerance, and how to use the intercultural dialogue to promote social inclusion. So um, Nada, um, since you've been so involved with promoting the concept of intercultural dialogue as a mechanism, as an instrument to uh, promote social inclusion and promote sustainable development, and of course you've been very much involved in the Baku process, uh, if you could enlighten us a little bit on how your engagement in the process has uh, helped uh, this dialogue and also the goal of partnership for sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olam. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here, of course, um, as um, uh, the lead uh, of the delegation of UNESCO, and, and quite a few of my colleagues are also here uh, in the second edition of the Heads of International Organizations uh, on the theme of social inclusion. Um, obviously, we can't think about lasting peace or sustainable development as long as we have exclusion and deep inequalities and as long as voices continue not to be heard just because they are different or they represent what we call minorities. Um, societies that are not inclusive are weaker, we know that. They are less resilient and they are more vulnerable to violence as everyday headlines show us. This vision is at the heart of Agenda 2030 and the promise to leave no one behind. And, and this means that we have to fight not just social, economic, and political inequalities, but we also have to fight to change mindsets. I think the opening statements today spoke a lot about this, the political will, the commitment, and how we can bring it around. UNESCO was one of the UN agencies created out of the destruction of the Second World War with the very special mandate to build defenses of peace in the minds of women and men. Our mission has not really aged a day, as relevant today as it ever was, but we have to follow a vast changing world. We see a dynamic a transformation which is upon us that challenges our fundamental values, our norms, our standards, most importantly, our freedoms. And we see every day the limits of hard power, which persist, um, and at the same time grapple with how to harness soft power, which is what the UN is supposed to be all about. Um, this puts in question the relevance of old institutions to, to tackle current uh, challenges. We talk about violent extremism, the migrant and the refugee crisis, the rise of hate speech in social media. Um, and this is what UN reform efforts are trying to mitigate. I think uh, uh, very much uh, a strong reflection of the Secretary General and the system's commitment to respond more effectively to national needs to make sure that we are anchoring our mandate in the core human rights and social justice prerogatives of the Sustainable Development Goals and to ensure that we have system-wide solutions to the current challenges and the emerging uh, threats. The Secretary General has just outlined in his report to the Economic and Social Council some of the progress that we have made so far. 
We have put in place a reinvigorated resident coordinator system. This is a network of Ghulam's peers across the world. A reassessment of our multi-country offices that need to deliver better development services. A reorganization of our regional assets. Quite often, the expertise that you need is not sitting at the local level, but you should be able to get them. And an overall strengthening of our accountability to member states and the people we serve. And that's very important to note. And as we roll out these reforms, it's clear that the United Nations will be strengthening the role of diplomacy and dialogue. As we see um, the challenges that face living together and respect of diversity. Um, and whether, again, as you heard this morning, from Sri Lanka to Libya and a lot of places in between and beyond, uh, we have many reminders of the failures of those things. This does call for revitalized member partnerships, of course, from the member states, but also the private sector, from universities, but also civil society. This notion of working together to innovate so that we can truly scale up our impact on the ground. It means that we have to build a new focus on resilience and conflict prevention, on learning and empowering individuals, especially young men and especially young women, uh, with new skills. Um, this is a little bit what UNESCO is trying to do uh, in our own rethinking exercise uh, as part of the UN reform. UNESCO is embarking on a strategic transformation and the role of young people has taken a bit the center stage. Uh, young people need attention and support, but most of all, we believe they need the space to upscale, to replicate their own initiatives. Um, we must find ways to empower them, not as uh, beneficiaries in the old way of doing things, but I think as partners, as change makers in their own communities, ensuring that they have access to the skills and to the competencies that will make them more effective citizens um, that we all need. This is for us a lot about promoting cultural lit literacy, mutual understanding and the respect for different cultures and religions. Most of all, the power of empathy. Uh, and I'd just like to give a few examples of our work in this area. Uh, we believe very much uh, being the house of culture, wherever a culture is threatened, we must respond with more culture, more history, more knowledge, more dialogue. Explaining why cultural diversity is important, how it strengthens us, how cultures are enriched by their mutual exchanges must be taught from an early age. And we have developed a publication about writing peace, which is available already in Arabic, French, Spanish, and English, to introduce children to our shared histories and the common future through a very simple presentation of writing systems around the world. We also need to work on capacity building activities. And we have a methodology called Story Circles for developing intercultural competencies in both formal and informal contexts. We have piloted it and we know that whether it is the integration of mar migrant communities in Austria or the exclusion of indigenous communities in Costa Rica, there is an appetite and there is a space for these kinds of tools. And obviously, uh, we must continue to respond together in an integrated and intelligent way across the UN system to the rising conflicts, disasters, and crises, whether man-made or natural. Um, UNESCO has chosen to make a symbol of the city of Mosul in Iraq. An estimated 90% of the old city was destroyed under the occupation of ISIS. And UNESCO and the Iraqi government have rallied the international community around the new initiative to revive the spirit of Mosul. I use this as an example because Mosul's centuries-old spirit of dialogue and coexistence um, is going to be uh, basically supported uh, by putting culture at the heart of the recovery process. So we are working with our partners on the ground, the UN system and beyond, to rehabilitate the cultural and educational institutions, including, obviously, the very residents of Mosul, uh, in every stage of the process, with a special emphasis on the role of local authorities, women leaders, young activists, who will make, we believe, the most important contributions to healing the social fabric. Um, and we know that it all starts with education and ends in many ways, but one of UNESCO's priorities is girls' education. And again, the access to the quality of educational opportunity for girls and women remains a major issue. This is, of course, the heart of Sustainable Development Goal 4, which we are very proud 
to lead on. Um, but I think that we have to look more widely. Um, you mentioned Sustainable Development Goal 17. 16 is also very important for us. I think the notion of social justice, of inclusive uh, systems, uh, of governance, of accountability uh, at the heart. Um, across it all, I think the need for a renewed commitment to strengthening the implementation of the human rights-based approach uh, in our work uh, for us, the right to education, of course, but also the right to cultural diversity, the right to freedom of expression, the right to enjoy the benefits of science. Uh, the S in UNESCO is for science. We are also deepening our body of work on ethical reflection. Just started thinking about the ethics of artificial intelligence um, and working on, overall, a better understanding of the relevance and centrality of the humanities in forging solutions. Um, for all this, we are thankful to the Baku Forum for being a platform, uh, giving us the opportunity to reaffirm our principles and practices, but also bring together some of our key practitioners. We spent yesterday in an academic forum with UNESCO chairs um, and UN experts discussing interreligious dialogue. Um, and I think we understand the need to have better impact on multilateralism. Um, I hope that you will continue to hold our feet to the fire where we fall short, but I think that we are um, very, very pleased to have these opportunities to come together as the United Nations and to work with you, particularly with the governments that share our value system in our own governance and collaboration. I look forward to speaking more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nada. I, I learned something new even as a UN staff today when uh, now I would recognize UNESCO as the house of culture. <laughs> and it is, um, it is so important in today's world, the role of UNESCO, because we've seen over the last two decades that culture and culture artifacts and heritage has become the very specific target of terrorism. Uh, we've seen it in Afghanistan with the 52 meter long Buddha statue which was blown up by the Taliban. We've seen it in Mali. We've seen it in Iraq and Syria with the destruction of cultural heritage. And also we've seen it in, in many other uh, places around the world. So it is very important. And thank you for reminding us of the role of uh, science, uh, the UNESCO vision, investment in young people, so important to educate them and change their mindset. Um, we will have session for Q&A, so please hold your questions to uh, Ms. al Nashif and the other panelists. I would like to now move to, uh, from the UN to the government and, and ask uh, our next uh, distinguished panelist, um, Ms. Sevinj Hasanova, um, who's been really at the forefront uh, of go the Azerbaijan government's uh, uh, efforts on uh, on SEG. Uh, just by way of small introduction, uh, Sevinj Hasanova is the Deputy Minister of Economy and she's dealing uh, currently or responsible for the Ministry's Sustainable Development and Macroeconomic Policies and anal Analysis and Strategic Planning. Uh, Ms. Hasanova has a long distinguished career with the Government of Azerbaijan in uh, very senior positions in different ministries. Uh, uh, dealing with economic issues and planning and statistics, but also sometimes she would like to challenge her intellectual vigor by going to uh, leading universities in Baku and providing lectures to, stu to students. So uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Hasanova. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you've been really a, a great partner, uh, the ministry and also the council uh, for sustainable development. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit uh, how the government of Azerbaijan has internalized the sustainable development goals and, and how, uh, what are the next steps in terms of uh, implementation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sagzai. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome all the participants of the fifth uh, World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue. It is a, a really honor for me to participate in such a, a distinct uh, forum and participate in uh, this panel. Uh, I uh, hope that uh, this forum uh, uh, will successfully um, uh, accomplish uh, its, uh, uh, its goals uh, for uh, fifth time. 
uh, taking into account that it's already fifth time uh, we are having this forum here, uh, that is already a success. And uh, I hope uh, that it will uh, continue and it will disseminate its value to across the world. Coming uh, to uh, uh, Azerbaijan uh, uh, and uh, its implementation of SDGs, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, stress that uh, Azerbaijan, uh, among uh, uh, 193 countries, joined uh, UN uh, 2030 agenda. And uh, since the beginning of this process, uh, we were involved uh, even in the uh, preparation of uh, the 17 uh, sustainable development goals through uh, public uh, government and wide participatory process and discussion process held uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, after adoption of uh, 17 goals, uh, Azerbaijan government has been uh, taking uh, serious steps, to steps toward implementation of uh, sustainable development goals. Actually, uh, we have a uh, tradition of cooperating with UN uh, uh, in its uh, initiatives, uh, starting from uh, MDGs. Uh, Azerbaijan also was very um, actively involved in MDG implementation, and we successfully uh, implemented that and uh, uh, achieved uh, the goals uh, stipulated in that initiatives. And Azerbaijan government were uh, awarded with South South uh, Award for, for its uh, accomplishment uh, and its uh, success in uh, tackling this uh, poverty uh, and uh, hunger. Uh, just uh, one figure shows uh, uh, the result we achieved for very short period of time. If uh, in early 2000s, uh, poverty level uh, in Azerbaijan was like half of the uh, population was living in uh, poverty, uh, nowadays uh, the poverty uh, level is just uh, 5%. And it is uh, uh, even less than uh, in, in many uh, developed, in some developed uh, country. And even in uh, the country which uh, more uh, uh, economic resources and more uh, GDP per capita. Laying on that uh, result, government of Azerbaijan very actively uh, came uh, into process of uh, nationalization of SDGs. Uh, we were inspired uh, by uh, 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 the uh, wide wideness uh, of those goals, uh, goals and uh, uh, by their <clears throat> comprehensiveness. And uh, Azerbaijan government started with institutionalizing uh, the process of implementation. We have created high-level council, which are coordinates uh, in country all the SDG implementation uh, process. And this council are headed uh, by uh, the deputy prime minister, uh, who is very keen in, in this area and who, who very actively uh, supports uh, the process. In this uh, process, we uh, pay uh, attention for the cooperation with international organization. And naturally, our major counterpart is the UN uh, resident office. Uh, with them, uh, we have started this process, and we hope that we successfully will continue uh, this process together. That is actually very important because those goals come from uh, the UN, and uh, they have most experienced people, they have more, more smart people engaged in that, that process. And countries like Azerbaijan need to uh, uh, find out more information, find out more ways uh, for more successful uh, implementation of the goals, and to get better world by 2030. And that we could do via the cooperation with the uh, UN, of course, and with the other international organization. We also pay uh, uh, good attention for regional cooperation. And with this purpose, last year, last October, together again with the uh, UN uh, uh, resident uh, uh, coordinator uh, office, we have uh, launched a regional uh, SDG forum where uh, participants from uh, the regional countries from Eastern Europe uh, until uh, uh, Afghanistan have participated and shared their experience on SDG imp implementation. And uh, that forum ended uh, with the Baku principle adoption. 
which paves a way about the successful implementation uh, of the SDGs in the regional countries. And I hope those principles will be taken as, a, as a guidelines in the regional countries. What are those principles? The first of all, you need to institu institutionalize the process, to have an institution which will be leading this in the country. Uh, what we have done, as I already mentioned, we have high-level council. Then for the lower level, uh, uh, working level, we established four working groups uh, which are coordinating uh, uh, SDG implementation in the three main areas of the 17 goals, which are economic area, uh, uh, social area, environment. And the fourth group, of course, is important. It is a monitoring and evaluation group because when you do not know what you have done, uh, you, you, it is very difficult to go further. Monitoring and evaluation uh, really uh, has a, a big emphasis on the successful implementation and successful work towards 17 uh, goals. And we have very uh, good and very challenged uh, groups who are working on all those four uh, areas uh, constantly, sharing their experience in the different countries as well and getting the experience from the different uh, countries. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, during the uh, implementation process, we uh, uh, were also among the few countries who uh, uh, voluntarily uh, uh, decided to report to UN uh, for second times. Our first uh, voluntary national uh, report was launched on, in 2017, and this year, uh, government of Azerbaijan prepared uh, a new report for the UN, which will be presented uh, at the this year, year's uh, high-level political forum in New York. Uh, between those reporting, uh, we keep, uh, to keep things going and uh, to keep things under control, we introduce uh, in-country level uh, reporting system. Each year, Council prepares a report about the SDG implementation and presents to uh, the head of the state, to the president, Ilham Aliyev. And that, I think, uh, uh, shows how uh, our country is committed to SDGs, how uh, uh, we uh, share uh, those values stipulated in those targets, and uh, how we would like our country to develop uh, until 2030 and uh, to become uh, more safe, more developed, more socially oriented uh, country. And for this purpose, uh, uh, we uh, are planning uh, to uh, adopt new strategy, longer term vision for the country development, 20, vision 2030. Uh, just for your information, uh, we, uh, uh, next year uh, we will be finalizing with uh, the 2020 uh, Azerbaijan 2020 vision for the future concept. And that will be a way how we will uh, continue uh, for the next uh, decade. Uh, for uh, uh, nationalization uh, of SDGs, we also were among the uh, few countries where uh, uh, rapid integrated assessment by the UN uh, 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 expert have been done and MAPS missions uh, have been done uh, successfully. Uh, we, uh, the uh, RIA uh, uh, report shows that Azerbaijan national strategy, national uh, development uh, agenda, development uh, uh, programs, concept, uh, already captures 62% of uh, the uh, sustainable development uh, goals and uh, uh, all the uh, uh, actions needed to achieve them. What is left is 38%, which we uh, are planning to capture in our 2030 uh, vision, and we are uh, ready uh, uh, and we are open for cooperation with international organizations, with, uh, of course, UN, uh, uh, UN uh, resident office, UNDP, um, and also we are happy uh, to continue our regional cooperation uh, towards the implementation uh, of SDGs. And for that purpose, we uh, will be uh, uh, launching a 
semi-annually uh, uh, SDG forum in Azerbaijan uh, where all the regional countries will uh, uh, share uh, their uh, next experiences and share uh, uh, their vision towards uh, SDG implementation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Deputy Minister Hasanova. And um, it's, it's really remarkable uh, to see Azerbaijan as a young nation uh, reduce poverty from almost 42% to 5%. Uh, so that's uh, really a testament to uh, the uh, investment in, 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 in the right places. Um, and also, uh, I must uh, say, uh, since I've been working here, I give myself a little bit of space to speak for Azerbaijan, is the level of ownership and commitment for UN conventions and, and, and uh, other mechanisms such as starting with the Millennium Development Goals, which was actually one of the precursor to uh, to Azerbaijan's really push to reduce poverty uh, in the country. And they managed to, uh, to, to achieve uh, and uh, meet a lot of the, the targets. Uh, and now under the Sustainable Development Goal uh, to establish, uh, right after the goals were adopted, a National Coordination Council at a very senior level under the Deputy Prime Minister uh, to really uh, uh, steer Azerbaijan's commitment and uh, efforts to achieve a sustainable development goal. So uh, you are really a good example in the region. Um, now I would like to go back to the UN. Um, I know, Ms. Hasanova, you're outnumbered here, so, but I'm sure you'll survive. Um, to um, our colleague from UNICEF, um, Aaron Green Greenberg, uh, who is the UNICEF uh, Senior Child Protection uh, regional advisor based in Geneva. Uh, Aaron, um, I had a very short conversation with him last night, uh, comes with a very long distinguished uh, career in the UN system and especially uh, uh, in the area of child protection, social welfare, justice reform and also complex emergencies uh, spanning uh, different countries uh, around the world. And when I asked him what is his passion he immediately said his children. He has two beautiful twins of five-year-old um, that he would like to spend a lot of time with and, and thus his passion for UNICEF as well. Um, so uh, Aaron, uh, welcome to the panel. And maybe uh, if I could ask you, uh, coming from UNICEF, um, how do you uh, approach social inclusion in early childhood development? and how social protection can address vulnerabilities uh, among children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first, thanks to the Azerbaijani government uh, uh, for, for having, having us all here and for convening this. Uh, thanks to, to you and the panelists and all of you in the audience. I want to start with my children who are five and a half years old. I know many of you probably have children, or if you don't, maybe grandchildren. I have five and a half year old twins, a boy and a girl, and they are an absolute handful. Um, <laughs> really uh, a joy, but they're also incredibly difficult to manage sometimes. And I'm gonna return to them a few times during this brief intervention. But I wanna say three things today, only three. Um, the first is that the debate is over about investments in early childhood. It is absolutely concluded amongst the academic community, amongst uh, high-income countries, amongst middle-income countries, increasingly everywhere across the world. The evidence is absolutely clear that the investments in early childhood produce enormous returns. So UNICEF conducted a study uh, based on this research across 73 countries, low and middle income, uh, in which 240 million children uh, don't have access to basic services in early childhood. Um, and now if you turn your attention to high income countries, the European Union member states, the US, uh, others around the world, 
you see enormous investments now flowing into early childhood. The EU's next multi-annual financial framework for the next six years is budgeting over $5 billion to transfer to member states to address inequities in early childhood. The return on investment only looking at preschool education, only at preschool, is $1 invested returns between $7 and $17 only on wages earned. The economic arguments are clear. Economic arguments tend to drive government decision making, but it's not the only argument. There are many, many arguments as to why these investments are incredibly important, um, and I just cite the economic one as a driving factor of why many governments are investing there to get long-term results on social equity issues, access to jobs, the economy, creating the new economy, being a part of the new economy, but being a part of new societies. So when I look at Lucy and Ethan, my twins, I'm thankful, deeply thankful, that I have the means and the access to all the services that they need, health, education, stimulation. Our knowledge about early stimulation is now unbelievably well developed on, on brain development, cognitive, intellectual development of, of adolescents and adults. Foundations for that are built in the early years. We now know this for a fact the debate is over. So the investment case for the long term on social inclusion, reducing inequalities, starts in early childhood. There's just no doubt anymore. High-income countries with the budget and the political will, it's not an issue. They can put the money there. Low-income countries, countries struggling with other basic access issues and other, other issues around development, have to make very palpable decisions about how to invest short and, and long-term, medium-term. And I won't pretend that's, a that's an easy solution, uh, but it's a real question that's facing long-term development, equality, uh, and outcomes in societies. The second point I want to make is about the abundance of information we have now about the levels of violence against children in our societies. It's unprecedented. Never have we known more than we know today. And this is not UNICEF saying it or some agency saying it. These are governments, many of whom are represented in this room, who are conducting these studies themselves. The methodologies for understanding and going into a home and measuring whether or not children are affected by physical, sexual, and psychological harm are well developed, have been tested, and are being rolled out. We've never known this before. We've made assumptions, we've made conclusions out of anecdotal evidence, but we've never known what we know. And what do we know? We know that there is no difference between high, middle, and low-income countries. This is a universal phenomenon. 50 to 70 percent of all children in all countries where these studies have been done, and they've been done across the world, are affected by some form of psychological, physical, or sexual violence. The percentages amongst ages 2 to 4 of severe physical violence, severe forms, is as high as 25 percent. What do we do with this information? Do we pull all these children outside of their families and protect them? No, probably not. <laughs> but we have to come to terms with the fact that violence in childhood is driving inequities and violence in adulthood, that the cycles of poverty repeat themselves in the cycles of violence. So, in addition to making sure children are in early childhood education and have basic health and, and other services, there is this critical question of how do we transmit the information that we need parents and communities to understand about reducing these levels of violence against children. I'm not talking only about rape and severe physical violence. I'm talking about psychological abuse. I'm talking about bullying. I'm talking about uh, spanking and hair pulling, all of which many of us experienced as children. But now that we know, causes severe harm in many children for the medium and long term, and that the outcomes associated with that violence are severe in terms of their attitudes, 
their beliefs, the way they resolve conflict, and this is at the heart of this conference and this gathering. So violence against children. And when I turn to my twins, Lucy and Ethan, I need assistance. I am the first one. This is not a them and us situation. This is all of us. When my twins are at my last nerves and I'm at the final breaking point, how do I restrict myself from screaming at them, from using physical force on them? It's a challenging thing to do for a new parent, any new parent. How do we transform that dialogue? I need assistance with that as well, even though I am an expert in child protection. This is a universal conversation. So we have to come to terms with how we address these things. I believe the solutions to the long-term problems we're discussing today lie in the generations that are being born or have been born in the past five to 10 years. Governments are recognizing this and doing a lot to invest in it. Um, a lot more needs to be done. The third thing that I would add is that in any setting, whether you're in Germany, high income environment, lots of resources, lots of political will, um, or in a country which is a much lower income country, maybe with a little less political will, um, whatever investment model that government employs, in terms of services, and everyone is employing different investment models, right? <laughs> different mixtures of interventions. There is this question of how you reach the most vulnerable. And there is a new profession in the world, a profession born no more than 100 years ago, much younger profession than teaching, medical professions, and others. And that is the profession of social work. And increasingly, we see investments in getting to a question of how do you get more access amongst populations that are completely marginalized? What are the approaches to doing that in a way that reinforces the fundamental values of universal human rights and children's rights? And it's not a silver bullet by any means, but it is an expression of will. Uh, on the government's behalf oftentimes to invest in solutions with communities about figuring out how do we deliver these messages together, how do we do this together, and an expression of that partnership from the government on these social issues that cut across women, children, the elderly, the disabled, all the groups that governments and communities are concerned with social inclusion. So while I talk about children and I talk about my son and daughter, Lucy and Ethan, I'm really talking about you know, the whole spectrum of society, communities, and how we see and prioritize investing for results in the long term. I do not believe there's any other way that is surefire than investing in younger children today for getting equitable outcomes in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for the very passionate um, reminder of, for, to all of us, as those of us who are parents, of how important it is to invest in early childhood. And that investment does not have to be in monetary terms. That investment has to be in many other ways to ensure that children upbringing are as such that they do not suffer psychological disorder later on, and that will then reinforce this cycle of violence and poverty in many societies. Now, I'm going to challenge you on one uh, statement, and that was uh, uh, investment of $1 will bring you $17. So I have two kids who will be going to American colleges soon, and you know how expensive they are. So I hope your words gave me some level of comfort that those investment are going to bring me back some return. Um, I'm sure it does. Um, now we're going to um, go to our next panelist uh, from uh, UNDP. Um, I, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Mr. George Buma, uh, who is the um, team leader for Sustainable Development Cluster at UNDP uh, Regional Hub or Regional Office in Istanbul. Uh, George also has a very long career with, with the UN system, 
uh, spanning board development and also peacekeeping in many different parts of the world, uh, focusing on issues of uh, good governance, uh, inequality, exclusion, and, and so forth. Um, let me also say that George has been uh, extremely helpful to us at the UN here in uh, Azerbaijan, but also to the government of Azerbaijan. He's been here many times to assist on the uh, Azerbaijan's effort uh, to put um, SDG uh, a plan together. So thank you, George, for, uh, for, for being here with us. Um, and as, as far as I know, you've been working on SDG uh, since they were adopted. Um, and I think one of the key questions for many of us is, uh, or one of the key premise of the SDG is how to reduce uh, inequality. Uh, because we've seen in the past that many countries uh, have, uh, rich countries have become richer and some poor countries have become poorer. And that's not only a phenomena to, to the developing country or middle income country. We've seen also that in many um, industrial or, or developed countries, uh, this whole issue of income inequality uh, or um, uh, that, that has actually uh, perpetuated uh, poverty in, in, in money society. So it would be very useful to hear your perspective and insight um, on what are some of the underlying causes of, of, of these uh, inequalities. Thank you, um, Gulam. Thank you for that warm introduction and um, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you very much to the government of Azerbaijan and the organizers for inviting me to participate. Um, I, I want to tackle the inequality dimension of, of the topic of this conference uh, and I want to discuss three specific issues. Um, the first one is a little bit on the background of inequality because I think it needs to be uh, you know, addressed a little bit because we all have different perceptions I think of what inequality is. And, and as an economist, I think economists are not really clear. They have differing opinions as well because they use different data, they use different ways of assessing inequality. And generally, um, you know, income inequality has been the key measure that economists have used to address policies around inequality. And I think we find as more data becomes available, the more we understand that perhaps some of these measures are perhaps not what we should be using. And I'll give you the uh, um, reason for that in a moment. But, but firstly, by using income inequalities, we do know that inequalities are increasing from an income perspective. We see in Europe, for example, that the top 1% have been able to um, get more than two and a half times the wealth than the bottom 50%. And this is a global trend, and this is happening everywhere. Um, generally, what we find in this region, however, is that uh, countries of the former Soviet Union are starting from a more equal base. Um, but of course, they're also subject to the same market forces that are driving inequalities elsewhere as well. Um, but I would argue that inequalities uh, of income inequalities are actually um, measuring uh, inequalities of outcome. And what I think we should be focusing on is inequalities of opportunity, which address many of the topics that we're discussing here today. Um, and I think people who are in absolute poverty not only lack both opportunities, but the means to change their status. And, and they lack what we call positive liberty. And they're also subject to negative liberty. So they actually don't have access to wealth and they don't have access to the opportunities that allow them to change their status within society. And I think increasingly we, we see this as an intergenerational perspective and it's transferred from, from family to, 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 to the next generation. And increasingly this is going to be exacerbated by climate change and environmental degradation. I think these are going to have se se severe consequences. And I think it's really clear that from an economic perspective that these, uh, where there's high levels of, of, of inequality of opportunity, it does have an impact on economic growth. So the second part of what I want to address is, is how do we use the SDGs and the leaving no one behind principle to address this phenomenon. I think the SDGs create a forum and they're great that they enabled us to distinguish countries um, that are performing well and those that are performing behind. And it does help as, as serving a platform through the high level political forum, for example, 
to, to allow political leaders that it's, that it's not just a, a, a global phenomenon, but they, there is, there's a responsibility there for political leaders as well. But I think from UNDP's perspective, we would argue that increasingly inequalities is much more a national development issue than it is about global sustainable development. And I think um, there's much that state actors can do, uh, but I think it's clearly a multi-stakeholder issue as well. So how do we create these platforms such as this one to bring multiple stakeholders into discussions around these issues? because we have to uh, be able to identify the communities that are actually subject to the inequalities and bring them into these discussions so we can find solutions to address this. And this is where the leaving no one behind framework becomes such a relevant topic for us to be able to work on. And, and we propose five factors that actually assess the inequality of opportunity. And, and these are firstly, socioeconomic status, second, discrimination, Thirdly, geography or location. Uh, fourth is governance. And fifth is the uh, vulnerability to shocks and fragility. For example, if, if you're unable to access service in rural areas, you're suffering from climate change issues, and you have limited access to opportunities, this is a crisis of opportunity. And, and it's really up to us to be able to use the SDGs and measuring those to be able to address them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this brings me to my third issue. What can we do about this? And I think, you know, firstly, you know, there's a government responsibility here where many governments are looking at the future of the welfare state. Um, how do we actually improve social welfare systems to be able to target appropriately? This is a topic of a lot of discussion amongst development uh, practitioners, and you've heard the, the case for early childhood. I think that's, that's really a, one clear um, opportunity. But we also see that labour markets are very precarious, where you know, um, probably more than you know, two-thirds of the population are in vulnerable, pop, uh, vulnerable work, where they're struggling to stay above the poverty line. This is an issue that needs to be resolved. Um, but increasingly, governments uh, are struggling from fiscal burdens, uh, increasing debts, and which restricts their ability to be able to address this. So we're increasingly looking at the role of the private sector to be able to reform not only welfare, but, but turn welfare into productive opportunities as well. And this is a key area where we're supporting a number of countries in the region to be able to reform between uh, welfare and labour markets. Uh, so we don't have two streams, but we, we try to bring people together to give them productive opportunities as well. Um, and, and there's two perspectives to the role of the pri private sector. The first one is on inclusive finance issues. Globally, about 1.6 billion people uh, are restricted from having access to banking and financial services. With the, with the opportunities of technology now, there's a great opportunity to bring these people into, into the finance sector, into the productive sector, which would be a huge economic opportunity. The second one is on inclusive business, where we recognise the role of the private sector to be able to address in a positive way those who are being uh, subject to the inequalities of opportunity, people with disability, youth, um, people who might not be able to take part in the, in, in the labour market normally? How do we actually engage with them? And this is work we're actually doing to try to improve training, education opportunities, improve the role of public employment services to reach out to these people to be able to give them satisfying opportunities to work and to take part in the community. And I think that this is a really important perspective, a role that we can work jointly with governments and the private sector to, to, to encourage further. So, in conclusion, I think the, the, one of the key problems that is in line with this rising inequality of opportunity is that we're finding that the general public are turning off from the role of political systems and governance systems. And we find a lot of perception surveys across the world where up to half of the population see that governments are now much more interested in vested interests and large single or few interests than they are in dealing with the, with the issues of the general population. And I think that this is worrying signs for a lot of democracies around the world. And I think you know, there's evidence that we're hearing that in the political systems this needs to be fixed if there's going to be a problem in addressing these inequalities. 
And I think also history shows us that uh, populism, that democracies, once inequalities rise, leads to populist upswings. And this upswings, obviously, the rhetoric of these uh, populist movements often don't address inequalities very well. But I think that we need to find constructive responses to inequality. How do we extend franchise to the vulnerable and excluded? How do we enact progressive income tax policies and social insurance measures? How do we build physical and human ca capital, opening up economies to um, embrace globalism, not turn away from globalism? And also, how do we prioritise full employment and migration? I think that these are areas where the multilateral system has a strong role to play. We're here to support governments in these efforts and also increasingly private sector interests. Uh, but we must ensure the, the importance and vitality of discussions such as we're having today. And I really commend and applaud the organisers for allowing us to, to have this platform. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, George, for um, uh, this very important element of uh, uh, exclusion, which is uh, rising inequality. And I think you've rightly said that uh, uh, now the fever of populism and uh, flawed political system around the world uh, fuels this sense of inequality, and that's why we see uh, rising uh, um, uh, disenfranchisement, uh, which is not just political, but also a lot of it is driven by economic factors, social factors. Um, so I think also uh, your point about the role of the private sector uh, and, uh, and also access to finance and how uh, the private sector can play a role in creating jobs and also um, uh, moving people from the social uh, welfare system to more productive employment. Um, our last but not least um, uh, speaker in the list um, is um, uh, the uh, executive director of uh, uh, UNWTO. So I, 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 I want to make it clear that this is not the World Trade Organization. This is the World Tourism Organization, which uh, sometimes uh, uh, often people mistake. And uh, Dr. Manuel uh, Butler-Halter uh, is with us. And just a little bit by way of introduction, um, uh, Dr. Butler has uh, served um, uh, at very high level uh, position uh, with the Spanish government promoting uh, tourism for the past 25 years and he's also been uh, a diplomat serving in, uh, in different countries, Germany, UK, USA and uh, what was also striking when I looked at your CV that your PhD is in naval architecture and, 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 and the connection with tourism uh, is probably fascinating as uh, uh, maybe you can, you can explain. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, Dr. Butler, is that um, uh, the role of tourism, uh, because we've seen, uh, despite um, a lot of the challenges and, 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 uh, and threat of terrorism, we see more people are moving, we see people are traveling, and it would be also important to hear your perspective on how tourism uh, contribute to the goal of sustainable development and, and, and also promotion of intercultural dialogue and, um, and also multiculturalism in general. So we would like to uh, hear your views on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the organizers of this uh, World Forum of Intercultural uh, Dialogue to bring all, all, all uh, together uh, here. Uh, it does uh, give me uh, the possibility to, to know uh, Baku, this fantastic city, uh, for a few days. I wasn't there here uh, never, but that's my f premiere. And I, I would like to thank you as well, the, the Azerbaijan government, for his commit its commitment to the accomplish and to the implementation and taking so seriously the Agenda 2030. I understand this World Forum, as says into action, is a meeting of people who want to get things to be done. That's why I go to straight direct to the topic. 
Uh, UNWTO, as you mentioned, is the agency of the UN family uh, for tourism. Um, and we are in charge of the promotion of the universally accessible tourism, of the sustainable uh, tourism, and the responsible uh, tourism. Uh, our primary task is to identify, to find global solutions for the problems that uh, are worldwide and the needs to respond to the needs of our members. That's why in 2019, uh, in 2020 and 2021, we have identified five prior priorities that gave us the member, our member states, and we are working on, on them. Uh, I would like to, to mention two of them that are related with this, with this forum. Uh, the first one is to create more and better jobs in tourism based on education, that's key. And the second one is that we want the tourism sector help protect our environmental, our cultural and social heritage worldwide. And that's, as I said, has connected with this, uh, with this forum. For me, uh, tourism is a, a passion, despite I am a naval architect, Dr. Naval Architect, I devoted uh, my whole life to tourism as a passion uh, for me. And I uh, believe firmly that uh, tourism is a facilitator, a catalysator of a, a intercultural dialogue, and one much important of, of, of it, uh, a, a driver of peace. Uh, let me quote Mark Twain very briefly. Mark Twain uh, wrote once that travel is fatal to pretty guys, bigotry, and narrow mindedness. I think that uh, what uh, Mark Twain wrote uh, once after coming from a travel from uh, to Mediterranean Sea and to and to Middle East it was completely right. And the studies that we have done in the ONWTO and different, uh, different institutions uh, states that tourism makes us more open-minded because we get in contact with different backgrounds, different cultures, and that helps us to think different and have ourselves a different perspective to everything. Tourists make us more trusting as well than all the humans. We belong, we have heard in the previous season and the opening, belongs to one race, the human race. There are no races at all. We are the same uh, as the other world. And tourists make us more creative. That's very important. Uh, to be in contact with different cultures, different backgrounds, uh, that makes us make easier to think out the box. That, that's what need uh, today. That means that more people traveling means more inclusive our our societies, and so that is that we think that travel and tourism is a human right, should be in the human rights regulation. Um, in 2018, we accounted for 1.4 billion uh, tourist international arrivals. It's an um, impressive, uh, impressive uh, figure, and in 2030, we will surpass the 0.8 billion tourist international arrivals worldwide. But it's, I think it's a very good news. That, that means that more travel, they're more open-minded, more trusting, and more creative, creative uh, people on the world. But we know you have pointed out that there are some hot spots, there are some uh, problems with the uh, growing uh, and growing, and uh, we have addressed the uh, tourism more, more caref careful, and that's why the importance of the SDGs that we are, as UN agency, uh, uh, belonging to the UN family, uh, completely devoted to the 17 SDGs and the UN agenda. The core of the values of tourism are completely aligned with the 17 uh, SDGs. Um, tourism affects all 
could affect all the 70 SDGs, but, it, but it's expressly mentioned in three of them. And the SDG 8 on decent work and economic growth, SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production, and of course, an SDG 14 on life below water. That uh, we have chosen this year as the year for job creation, and it's devoted our World Tourism Day, will be held uh, the next uh, 27 September in New Delhi. Uh, I will mention the SDG 8, the tourist has a lot of things to say and to do as a driver of decent work and prosperity for the nations. Um, tourism is already a major economic factor. About 10% of the global GDP is directly or indirectly stemmed from tourism. One on 10 jobs worldwide is connected to the tourism industry. These figures are even higher when we are talking of, uh, about the countries, mm, not so developed countries, the poor countries. That the people in the host community should be benefit from tourism. The diverse value chain of tourism gives a lot of opportunities for jobs and inclusion. I think it's key to include locals in the value chain of tourism, providing training, including them as core folks or and the, using the services and products that are produced locally. The, mainly the entry level for many jobs in tourism is rather low, and their job position, they are um, mostly stable, even in times of crisis. Uh, the tourism is, uh, sector is an important force as well for migrants in the society. The task acts diverse and the direct exchange with colleagues and clients helps them to improve their language skills. Tourists can especially foster decent work for women, connecting SDG 8 with SDG 5, uh, gender equality. We are working today on the second edition on Global Report on Women on Tourism, jointly with the UN Women, the German Agency of Cooperation, GIZ, the World Bank, and Amadeus, the company Amadeus. Our findings are very interesting, that the majority of the tourist workforce are female, that tourism provides greater opportunities for female entrepreneurships as other economic sectors, and that the wage gap is smaller in tourism than in other economic sectors. I can talk and talk about tourism. I invite you, if you have time, for the site event that we are taking a place. It's taking place in the afternoon in the room H4 about tourism and concrete things with concrete initiatives that I think uh, are uh, highly relevant and interesting of inclusion tourism, how, how can tourism improve inclusion uh, worldwide. Uh, I am at, the, at your disposal to, to hear your comments, your questions, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Butler. And I must say that uh, your job is easy because everybody loves to travel. Everybody loves tourism, right? Um, and I think it goes without saying that it has such a fundamental role in society in terms of creating jobs, understanding, and also uh, uh, promoting uh, cultural dialogue, tolerance, and, and, and other uh, social benefits. But uh, I think what's important, what you highlighted, is that we should encourage sustainable tourism. Tourism that does not uh, damage the environment, tourism that does not contribute to more uh, carbon emission, uh, tourism that protects the, the very precious uh, natural resources that we have. Um, and also, I like your uh, focus on tourism as a human rights, which uh, many, many 
uh, countries or people probably don't realize as uh, it is a right for people to travel and to enjoy themselves and to learn from other cultures. Uh, let me also highlight, uh, I should have said this at the beginning, that the UNW2 has also been a long-standing partner uh, with UNESCO uh, to the Baku process and to the uh, uh, Baku forum, the fourth one, the fifth one. So we very much appreciate uh, your partnership and uh, uh, happy that you're here. Uh, colleagues, uh, that brings us to the uh, round of introduction and remarks from our five distinguished panelists. Um, uh, it's almost time. I, I must say I must appreciate and thank our panelists to be really brief and on time. I didn't even keep track of it. Uh, Self-discipline worked. Um, but we would like to uh, dedicate five to ten minutes to, uh, in case there are any uh, questions, any remarks, uh, both from the audience and perhaps also if any concluding thoughts from uh, the panelists. And then we will be out of here in, uh, very quickly. Please, gentlemen, uh, can we get the microphone? Uh, well, maybe for me, but not the audience in the back. <laughs> okay, uh, it's coming. Thank you. Just bear with us five more minutes and then we will let you go to have a wonderful lunch. Uh, good afternoon, Excellencies. This is Bayezid Kasi. I'm the Central Joint Secretary of Pakistan Movement of Justice, the party in power in government. So my question, uh, it's uh, like you said, uh, uh, question or remarks. So it's a question and um, some, some of my views about uh, uh, actually all the things that uh, all our prestigious uh, five panelists had said, uh, especially about uh, uh, the representative from uh, uh, UNHCR who talked about uh, you know, the child uh, um, uh, you know, these days what the children are suffering from and uh, then we talked about, uh, uh, you know, how to, you know, have a mental uh, sort of a thing that we can, you know, coop up with the children's minds and all that. When coming from Pakistan and then coming from Balochistan, uh, well, uh, in Pakistan we see uh, that uh, there are a lot of conferences uh, with regard to United Nations and you know, you have a lot of fancy boards and everything. They talk about, you know, that they're against child labor and this and that. And it has been going on ever since, you know, its inception. But on ground, the realities and uh, are quite uh, different. And, uh, you know, uh, involving what my recommendation uh, uh, to you, Excellencies, should, uh, would be my kind recommendation that once you come up with policies and once you come up with uh, certain projects related to, uh, you know, let's say tourism, let's say um, uh, children's rights, human rights, they should not only be uh, just, uh, you know, conveyed to the people of certain group who can sit in uh, these auditoriums and convention centers. Rather, the UN should uh, focus more about advertising their policies on grassroots level because had it been just for us, you know, we are th that group of people who actually don't even scold our children. So it's actually for the people of the grassroots and your voice is unable to be reached by them. So once you're having your projects in all these, uh, you know, like I can quote a very beautiful example that we have a hotel in which I, uh, you know, uh, attended a, a conference on the United Nations uh, Development Program and some UNHCR and the moment I come out in the very hotel, the, 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 the parking, uh, the, the valet is uh, actually a 16-year-old. So the thing, this is just an example, and you know very well that uh, in countries such as Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, and talking about the countries of the Middle East who are suffering the most, like Gaza, Palestine, Syria, where people, you know, they, 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 do, they actually do not have any time to think about whether their uh, twin children are having something. They're, they're actually thinking about whether I'm going to see that twin at night when I come back or whether it's just going to be me not seeing their dead bodies or something like that. So I think the United Nations should now 
actually focus upon implementing these things that we read in the soft books and actually do this because for heaven's sake guys we are all um, you know in our countries we see miseries and then we see that one light uh, that is the UN, uh, the united nation which has you know so many sub I, i'll call everything sub brands these are all sub brands of the, the main product and then actually you know we are not we cannot afford to buy these brands so make it a little bit accessible and more practical. Thank, thank you very much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's uh, take a couple of more. Um, okay, I have two hands there. Um, the gentleman first. Yeah. And, and please uh, keep your comments or questions short because we don't have much time and we want to give everyone a chance. Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity and thanks all the panelists for uh, this uh, presentation. My name is the Reverend James Morbel Wier. I work with an Imam, Imam Norain, in the same office for 25 years. But what I want to really, I want to ask uh, specifically on the UNICEF, uh, I mean UNESCO uh, intervention uh, on the interacting with the DRADs, um, deradicalizing those formers. Uh, we have a very big task in the Sahel region of the South Saharan region uh, in West Africa and other African uh, areas. What narratives, uh, what messaging strategy do you have? And what are you doing with formers who have been radicalized before and now they have caused injury in the society. What are those things you are doing with religious leaders for counter narrative and also sending up a new strategy for reintegrating? Uh, briefly, I'm very short. In Nigeria, we have what they call rite of passage that the military are de-radicalizing de people, but the communities are not accepting them. So coming from an experience, a former, uh, I lost my hand fighting with Muslims in Nigeria, and now we are friends. And we are saying, what rules for religious leaders to pragmatize, actionize these things that you are doing? Uh, we are interested really to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the gentleman behind, yeah. Um, I'll try to be short and sweet, I hope. My name is Hussein Mutalib. I'm from Singapore, representing a Muslim organization, the biggest Muslim organization in Singapore. Uh, my question is directed to our respectable speaker from UNICEF. Um, I think all of us love children, and it's rightly so. I have one small observation and one small question for you, sir. A small observation is this. With your reference to the critical role of preschool education, I think it cannot be a coincidence, isn't it? The latest World Global Happiness Index correlates with countries, happiest countries, which spends tremendous investments on preschool education, mostly in the Scandinavian region. So, you spend heavily on preschool education, best teachers teach the lowest of children, you become happy adults in your later life. It's indeed a strong direct link, uh, suggesting and supporting your argument. My second thing is a, is a question. This is about the violence about children, totally unacceptable, totally saddening, and something must be done quickly about this. You know, the location, all of us know, where upon violence against children occurs in the institution called the family. Question is, what can be done by UNICEF and others and us to penetrate this institution which is characteristically closed, confined, and not ordinarily accessible to us? Thank you. Thank you. Let's... Um, um Okay, let's take two more, and then that's it. Let's give a chance to the lady. <laughs> we have to be a little bit more gender balanced. <laughs> Thank you. 
So my name is Arafa Zulfikarova, young STG ambassador for quality education. I would like to thank you for your amazing sharings and experience with us. My question is directly about this. As you know, in our country, we have amazing kindergartens. And by share, each, um, sending our children to kindergartens, we assume that our children can get the best education in there in, during the preschool period. I would like to hear about your recommendations and advices, what kind of social impact we can create to increase the education during the early childhood period as an SDGs promoters. Thank you. Thank you for that very short, specific question. There was one more hand there, and let's just take that, and then we will return to panels. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, and uh, my question to the Mr. Butler. Uh, first of all, welcome to Azerbaijan. Uh, we know that we are four years moving toward the sustainable development goals, and two years ago, UN declared uh, 2017 the year of uh, international, uh, in the year of sustainable tourism for international development. It's kind of recognition that tourism could contribute to uh, all SDGs directly or indirectly. And my question is, uh, which are the concrete indicators that let us to measure to what extent the tourism is sustainable? We know that different structures like EU and uh, Global Sustainable Tourism Count, uh, Council offer a set of indicators that let us to measure uh, sustainability of destinations of, or management or ecological environment. But if, is there a universal set of indicators that let us measure sustainability in any area? And the second part of question, is there interculturality factor integrated to this set of uh, indicators? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, very good question. Let me just um, go by, by order of how they were um, presented. Um, Mr. George um, Boma, maybe if I could ask you to uh, tell us a little bit about the question from the gentleman from Pakistan on how to, can we reach out to the grassroots and how, do we, how does the UN get its message across? And of course, um, uh, other colleagues can also uh, express their thoughts on that, but let's start with UNDP. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the question. And um, it's, it's, it's a tricky one, indeed. And I understand uh, your point of view. I've spent time working in Afghanistan. I've spent uh, three years working there and, and understand the problem at the grassroots. And it's, it's not a simple one. It, it's, you know, and if we sit here and suggest that it is a simple response, then I think we're missing the point of what we're trying to do. I mean, and, and, you know, the mechanisms for local development, and we all know that the solutions for problems are at the local level. The governments can only set the policies, the solutions come from the grassroots. How do we reach out more effectively to uh, those grassroots? I think, you know, we, the, the, the beauty of the SDGs, and this is what I come back to um, all the time, is that they provide a human rights based approach for dealing with development issues, which we haven't had previously as an international multilateral system. We had the MDGs, but it was very much about delivery of overseas development assistance. The, the, the role of the SDGs is really to look at the full range of development and see how different parts of communities are performing on that. And that requires multiple stakeholders to act. The UN is not perfect, and I don't think it was ever created to be perfect. It also suffers from problems that we need to recognise and we need to work with as well. And obviously this is very much context driven as well. And you know, knowing the situation a little bit in Baluchistan, I mean it's a complex issue. There are many different players. Some are more amenable to discussions than others. So you know, it, it depends very much on these issues. And are we going to find solutions everywhere? Probably not. But we need to try, and that's, the, I think, the essence of what the SDGs are trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. And then maybe, uh, Ms. Nadal Nash, if I could ask you a specific question to UNESCO on countering radicalism and integration of those who've been uh, affected. Thank you. Let me, um, at the beginning, just compliment what George said. I think 
for the gentleman from Pakistan and, and, and very much in the same spirit as what George said, I think that this is also an issue of communications and advocacy. I think it's very clear that while the bulk of our resources are actually sitting at the field level, at the country level, at the local level, we also need to be speaking to policymakers. And I think understanding this range of interlocutors is very important. I think we, this is a reminder about the need to do a better job in our communications also. I think our advocacy uh, is still a little bit behind our capacity to do things, um, and, I, and I take that to heart in terms of trying to do a better job. Um, for the Reverend, thank you very much for your remarks. I think this is a very important part of the work that we do on de-radicalization and counter-narratives. We're going to have a session uh, in, this, in this forum, I, I hope you'll come to that, with the Office for Counterterrorism on working with young people. And actually, we had invited, and I'm not sure if he's here, but we invited a former child soldier from Uganda who is with us. Um, uh, how do we do it? I'd like to mention one example. Uh, we work with our goodwill ambassador, the actor Forrest Whitaker, who has the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative, working particularly in South Sudan, and working in the north of Uganda. And the example is an integrated one of, first of all, understanding how to uh, remove stigma from these uh, groups of young people, understanding how to work with a very broad range of stakeholders. So it's not about them, it's about their communities, it's about their families, it's about their leaders uh, insofar as they recognize their authority because this is also a very complicated issue. Um, and it's also about learning a lot from the experiences. And over the past uh, five or six years now, we've grown uh, from how we develop the community centers, how we build the education hotspots of knowledge, how we understand the reskilling, uh, and, and how we accompany the psychological uh, aspects of this. So it is an integrated uh, effort. And it's many, many parts of the UN system. We do this in partnership with UNICEF. We do it in partnership um, with the Office for the High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, and we do it most of all with local authorities who have been very supportive. And, and we can talk more, but there will be some opportunities during this uh, couple of days to, to see some more examples. Thank you. Thank you, Nada. And as uh, she said, and also Dr. Butler, there are many more sessions which would be touching upon some of these issues at much more detail, so I encourage you to participate. This is just an introduction to some of the very fundamental issues. But let me turn to Aaron, who um, there were a couple of questions uh, on uh, preschool education, um, and uh, I'd like you to share your thoughts on that. Sure, happy to. Um, Thank you so much for the questions. I want to start with the gentleman in, in the front row, uh, the honorable gentleman from, from Pakistan. Uh, you're absolutely right. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we need to do more. Um, the acceptance of these issues by governments also needs to be there in order to facilitate the transmission of the messaging. Sometimes we find ourselves constrained by that, and I don't think the prescription of conferences and awareness raising and high level events is, is really opening necessarily those doors. I think we re need to rethink sometimes our strategies for opening up that space for the UN to play a better role with communities. So I, I fully endorse, endorse uh, your, your, your views there. I want to also say a word about violent extremism, violence. I mean, there's a lot we can learn from, from the peace and reconciliation in equally as disturbing events in, in places like Sierra Leone and Rwanda where, where, where the, the answer was not punitive. The answer was not, you've committed these heinous crimes as children, as adults, as women, um, but the answer was peace and re reconciliation at community level. Yes, there was a punitive element, but the majority of it was about reconciliation and moving forward and acknowledging. You know, in Latin America, that didn't happen as much during, during, during the conflicts in Latin America. And I think that's borne itself out in, in quite a kind of a way that we can feel in the air, in the political air in Latin America at times. Uh, so I think we can learn from the ways in which these kind of events, this is not new, right? Extremism and, and violence of this nature is not new in the world. We have seen it before, we have dealt with it before. And I think we can look back and see it. What were the better ways? And I think a lot of the countries today would be, would be wise to learn from that. On the gentleman's question and, and, and the young lady's question around, around investments, uh, and, and thank you for reinforcing with, with additional evidence on, on, on preschool, 
Um, but this question about how do we get at violence, if 70% of households, 60-70% are using some forms of psychological aggression and physical punishment for very young children, and that is contributing to a cycle of violence and intergenerational transmission, how do you get at that? Did, I don't, wouldn't want to pretend to have the answer, but a lot of it is about the transmission of information about the harmful effects. Many of us were raised in households, perhaps, where this was common, um, where a slapping or a beating was common, <laughs> where hair pulling or yelling was common. Um, usually at the point of delivery, antenatal, prenatal antenatal services, home visitation of nurses, um, to transmit the information to new parents about that, it's not a part of the package that's yet transmitted through the major delivery systems that governments and communities have at their disposal for new parents. Transmitting that information, empowering people with the knowledge we have, and letting them internalize it and discuss it, I think is, can create enormous gains. We have some evidence around this that you can really reduce a lot of those levels of violence through the transmission of information, the reinforcing of that information, and coming up with strategies to deal with those moments of frustration. Um, and I think that speaks a little bit to the young, to the young, la the young lady's uh, question and comment as well, which is, you know, how do you amplify this? How do you, and it's not really just about pre uh, preschool and kindergarten. Everyone kind of understands that now and is investing, but now the evidence is also showing us that school, formal school in the form of preschool, shouldn't go much lower than five or four. That, you know, you, you, really, you really want to create socialization stimulation. That stimulation is so important at a young age. I mean, when I came across this evidence, it shocked me. It changed the way I fundamentally deal with my children at a young age. Because I know that if I stimulate them in a very simple way, eye contact, expressions, that their fundamental development of their brain is different. And that's the foundations for a lifelong of learning, a lifelong of cognitive relationships, relationships building with individuals. So I think we have to transmit information that empowers parents all over the world to, to, to do the things that sometimes we forget to do that have enormous consequences, or sometimes we do by mistake that have enormous consequences and that aren't known. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question was uh, directed at uh, WTO. So, Mr. Butler, if you talk, tell us about this universal indicator that responds to sustainable tourism. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to answer the, the representative of, of Pakistan. Uh, I completely agree with what you, you have just told talk about the, we have to do more. Yeah? But at the same time, I completely agree that we, uh, there is a lack of communication that the UN family is doing worldwide, it's tremendously. I am an engineer, I am a practical, uh, a practical person, uh, 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 at least uh, I think I am, I am so. And uh, we are doing a tremendous effort to do more and to on concrete things. The, everybody is in favor of good and against the bad. But of course, we have to do more concrete things. That's why, for example, in the uh, side session, uh, uh, in the afternoon, we bring some concrete examples of things of inclusiveness and uh, peaceful efforts uh, in, the, in the field of tourism. Re answering the, the representative of Azerbaijan, thank you very much for your, for your question. Uh, we are working since uh, 2016 with the call conference in the Philippines uh, defining the MST. MST stays for measuring the sustainability of tourism. Uh, we have a working group of experts, 25 uh, countries that are involved in there and other uh, or, uh, international multilateral organizations like, for example, ILO, or like, for example, the OECD, Eurostat, uh, different uh, UNDPs as well as in uh, our working group in order to define uh, a common basis, uh, 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 a standard measuring the sustainability of tourism in, this, in these three pillars. The economic, this already done through the TSA, Tourism Satellite Account, the uh, uh, 
uh, environmental we are adapting the uh, S, uh, system, uh, environmental system of the UNDP, and the problem is to define the social vector. The social vector, we are working on it, then we can, uh, we, we have to have data that is uh, produced every, every, every year. We can produce, uh, we can require different data. Uh, that's why answering your, uh, your response about the multiculturality is very difficult to involve the multiculturality indicator uh, to define the indicator worldwide and integrate in the MST. The MST will be approved in, uh, by the, uh, uh, the statistics division of the UN in New York uh, the, coming, the coming March next year. What we are doing in order to foster, to promote the interculturality, we are devoted to the uh, uh, cultural international itineraries, like, for example, the Silk Road. And that's the way where we think we can promote and we can uh, achieve uh, the, the integration of interculturality. Thank you. And the integration of interculturality. Thank you. And I'm going to give the last word to Ms. Sanova. Would you like to say anything on some of those questions briefly? Thank you, uh, Mr. Isaac Zai. I also would like to thank for the participants for their very active uh, uh, engagement in, into the discussion. Uh, there were issues about the, uh, how we could disseminate uh, this knowledge in order to get more results. And uh, what I would like to say that in, uh, when I just uh, graduated from high school and came to my first job in the Ministry of Finance, that was early years of Azerbaijan uh, regain its independence. And international organizations uh, were uh, just opening their offices in our country. And first IFIs, uh, which opened uh, office in uh, just uh, uh, Ministry of Finance, was uh, uh, IMF. And at that uh, uh, time, uh, they uh, brought as a, a head of office very wise, very experienced person. Uh, Turks by uh, nature, and uh, when in the morning I was meeting each time him and uh, uh, greeting him, uh, how are you, uh, asking him how are you, he was answering, uh, uh, which means, uh, let's say that I'm good in order to be good. <laughs> and two years ago, my daughter came to me and uh, said me that I would like to be a doctor, and I uh, just uh, uh, decided to go to uh, Germany uh, for this, and I already uh, 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 asked uh, school to include me into German uh, language courses. She did it her own. Uh, I, was so, I thought that uh, it's too long to, uh, uh, to study for doctor and said, you could be a very good doctor, but you also could be a very good economist as I am. And just uh, last year, she came and said, yes, I would like to be an eco economist and go to US for the uh, 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 economic degree. And I understood that what we say today, it doesn't go for air. It goes really for people's mind and as much we say the good things, as this wise, wise uh, uh, gentleman was saying, let's say good things in order to be good, then uh, you get it from time. And uh, uh, coming back to SDGs, what, is, what are the SDGs? They all are universal, very smart goals, very good goals uh, for all countries, for the people to inspire to achieve them. And I think we need to talk, need to discuss them more and more. And in so, after some times, we will see that people already more committed, people know about more, and people already starting to implement those SDGs themselves. Actually, SDG is not about the uh, UN. SDGs is not about the governments only. SDGs is about everybody. SDGs about the businesses, about governments, NGOs, about each of us. And it touches, they are smooth, so smart that they are, touches each of us, each family. 
So let's talk about those smart, good things every day. And I think that then at least next generation will be much better and much smarter behaving and managing their countries, their organization, and their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, bringing those personal uh, insights and perspective. Um, colleagues, this uh, pretty much brings us to the end of our uh, session. I just wanted to conclude by saying one thing that also resonates with a gentleman's uh, comment from Pakistan, and that is, uh, I think he also made the reference to all the logos you see, different UN organization. Um, and I have to say, which something also Nada referred to, the UN reform is aggressively underway to bring us together, to bring this multiplicity of of, of uh, added value or uh, expertise that exists in the UN system uh, together and, and, and support uh, government. So uh, with that thought, I would like to uh, uh, thank all our panelists for uh, their contribution and presentation. I would like to thank you for listening patiently. You are the survivors, um, so congratulations. And also I want to thank the organizers for, uh, of this forum. Uh, so with that, I wish you all uh, uh, a happy bon appétit, bon appétit and, and lunch. Thank you. <laughs>